Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Pod and the Pendulum, the horror movie podcast that covers all the franchises, one movie in one episode at a time. As always, I am your host, Mike Snoonian, and I'm not going to lie. I am having a bit of an existential crisis tonight because on Friday, I walked out of Bar Oppenheimer and I walked out of that cinema and it was like easily the best movie going experience I've had in years. It was not only two of the best films I've seen all year that just had me in complete awe of the power of cinema, but just seeing everybody treat it like an event, seeing young kids like dressed up as their favorite character and just giddy with excitement. It reminded me of what seeing Batman must have been like in 1989, like a real event, knowing you're seeing something special. And just it completely bowled me over. And after that, on Saturday, we recorded on Jaws 3. And here we are two nights later, recording a little ahead of time, talking about Jaws the Revenge. So I just feel like we've gone from the heights to the nadir. However, I will say this. Sometimes talking about these less than I can hear my cat howling in the background. He feels my pain. Sometimes talking about these less than stellar movies is really a journey in and of itself. And there are really fewer people in the world I'd rather speak with. Like there is no one better equipped to talk about these movies than my co-host for tonight. He is also the co-host of the Spectre Cinema Podcast Club who is doing the Lord's work this month with his take on like Wi-Fi in horror and online horror. Mr. Devon Taylor. Devon, how are we? Hello, hello. I'm doing fantastic. And uh and yeah, it's uh yeah, been a little mixed bag with uh, the Wi Fi or die yeah. theme and then and then here I've been like coming on taking taking the bullets too, doing some of the less desirables. But you know, it's a, it's it, it's paying it's paying my uh pot and pendulum dues, you know. I mean, because yeah. that, that's the fun of these, you know. I can't only yeah. come on to only do the favorites and the good ones, you know. I gotta I gotta show my you know, as a true completist, yeah. uh, I am here for a these ones <laughs> and you were not expecting that creed from me at the beginning of because you're like where is he going oh no i this no i knew exactly where you were going mm-hmm. because like i've had like a week of just like a lot of uh mid movies and then like mm-hmm. you know like it, but then when i do watch a good one sprinkled in yeah. there it, like you say it may, I'm, i appreciate it a lot more so we're gonna record this and mm-hmm. now i'm going to barbie yeah. afterwards so hopefully Excellent. this Excellent. means Enjoy yeah it. yeah it's gonna Devon. hit harder There were so many young ladies dressed up for Barb and Hire, and it was amazing seeing so many 13-year-old girls dressed in pork pie hats with candy cigarettes (laughs) coming out of their mouth for Oppenheimer. Like, absolutely just couldn't believe it. But we are not alone. We have somebody else on this skiff with us tonight. He is joining us for the first time tonight. He is the co-host of the Men Who Like Men Who Like Movies podcast, a creature feature lover, and a man who has always dreamed of making love to an angry welder. Sean Murphy, how are we tonight? <laughs> I am doing great. I still have not got that dream down, so... <laughs> well, let's make that happen. Let's, let's. You could be a stand-in for Steven, uh, Chewy Foxworthy. You two look very similar. It's amazing, <laughs> and I've never seen you two in the same room. So, all right. And- no, no, you never will because you, we got to keep Are you anti chewy? <laughs> no, we got to keep the mystery alive. We got to keep the mystery alive. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Sean, let's try okay. to get you that angry welder. Are you seeing someone right now? I'm not to put you on the spot, not to. No, yeah. no, right now, my the Caesar Baron. <laughs> okay, so tell me about your ideal first date. What's going on with this? Where are you going? Well, it's again, you weren't expecting this. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say, no, it's all good. Um, It will probably not involve the water because there are sharks there. Um, I live by Lake Michigan, so there's probably not very many, but you there's always a chance. You there's always a chance. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I don't know. I as long as there is fun involved, that is all that. What's your move? 
What's your room? Is Ooh. it, hey, baby, how about you and me do some dancing? Because that used to be mine. Didn't work. Ooh. Yeah, I was going to say, mine is a lot of awkward. So it's a lot mm -hmm. of, uh, uh, how about, I, I, I'm, I'm a fount of useless information. So I will mm -hmm. just be like, mm. hey, did you know that? And then insert some random fact here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to overshare because I put you on the spot. Uh, so I think with my wife, my move, because we met online way back. We met on Craigslist way back in 04. And I think my gambit was after we went to a bar together and she has a British accent. So in my mind, I'm thinking if I shut my mouth, just ask questions and then be very quiet, I could be making it with Mary Poppins later on. I'm not kidding. So then we went to a midnight screening of of Jackie Brown. And my wife does not like to go to bed past 9 p.m. So that was amazing that our first date, she did that. I did not know that at the time. And I think I said, you look way better than your picture. And I think you should come home with me tonight. And she did. So <laughs> that was my move. And it worked. So you started, believe it. You started off with the best Quentin Tarantino movie. Uh, nice. I was about to say that's, that's the only movie. that's like the only romantic Tarantino movie that you can go and watch with somebody. Mm -hmm. So that's great. And and not gonna lie, in in the day of apps, if you put in your app looking for looking to fuck an angry welder you will get so many hits that's actually so a, that's actually a great like uh app bio like nothing yeah. else in the bio either just put that and then if they know yeah. then you then it's like oh i got a special one here yeah. so so we are like here. that's a very niche that's very yeah. niche <laughs> so listeners we are here to talk jaws the revenge tonight and i've been putting it off uh, I can already tell this is going to be a fun conversation. I'm looking forward to this. But let's start with some initial thoughts. And Sean, as our guest, why don't you tell us like your first time you watched Jaws the Revenge and, you know, why, you know, because you were like, hey, I'll do this one. Like you got volunteered by your co-host, but you were like very quick to put on that life vest and jump into these waters. No more ocean puns. Sean, give us your initial thoughts. <laughs> well, so the first time I saw this was, oh, I, I don't even remember. I think I was around mm, probably 10 or 11. And they were having a Jaws, like, marathon on TV. Mm -hmm. And I watched, they did Jaws, Jaws 2, and then Jaws the Revenge, <laughs> which they just completely skipped 3. So I didn't see 3 until much later, but I digress. Um, I remember watching... I absolutely love jaws love jaws too and then i watched this one and i was like where's the shark <laughs> and that is still how i feel a lot about right. this movie <laughs> because this movie is it while i commend it for trying to make the characters more important you can't always just completely sideline your shark in your mm. shark movie like this is like this is a drama with a special guest star sure. of the shark. <laughs> it was like when you would have the love boat, you would have the special guest of the week. The shark was like on the love boat. <laughs> Yes, exactly. I was going to say, they were the feature, like if uh, they, they are a feature and they are not going to get the Emmy for this one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because the movie is like 90 minutes. So it's about 30 minutes shorter than Jaws. I would venture to say that the shark is on screen more than the shark is in Jaws. Like when they show it, they show a lot like too much of it because it's not a good model. But I think you're right. Like in the original Jaws, even though you don't see the shark a lot, you feel his presence a lot exactly. more. Where here, it's kind of like, are these two like people going to bone? What's up? Like that is like the vibe. <laughs> this is kind of like a side quote to how Stella got his groove. You called it how Ellen got her groove back. Like you would be right. <laughs> That's what, what the subtitle should have been. It shouldn't have been Jaws of Revenge. It should have been Jaws, how Ellen gets her groove mm -hmm. back. Ellen's groove never <laughs> left because Wood at this age in this movie, mm -hmm. Wood. Shoulder pads and all. Okay. <laughs> yes. Um, no, yeah, bring shoulder the pads. pads. Um, I put a note in my notes. It says Our Lady of Shoulder Pads. Ellen so, Brody. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. What is it about 
creature features and maybe like really like B movie creature features that is near and dear to your heart? Oh, they're just so much fun. You know, you can't, there are so many movies that like just try to be too serious. And if they throw a little, like throw a little camp, throw a little fun in them and you're going to have fun. Like Jaws 3 is, it's not, it's not amazing, but at least it tries to have fun with what it's doing. This Mm -hmm. one tries to be serious and it's too serious. Like even Jaws has moments of levity and comedy that make it, it's such a classic like it's such a a, a match of, of like a mismatch of genres almost that come together perfectly into like one of the greatest films ever made this one is very much like i think they try to have comedy but none of it really lands for me and the characters are like some of the characters like especially michael is like is the worst he's the worst. oh yeah we'll talk about that <laughs> Devon, how about yourself? What are your initial thoughts here? Oh, man. So, yeah, uh, it's been two days of uh, watching these sequels for the first time. I haven't seen any of the other ones besides the original Jaws. And uh, the number two was, like, aggressively mid. It was just, like, so just, like, kind of, hey, what are we doing here? What is this? Mm -hmm. Uh, We'll give it points for cinematography. Uh, Three... Uh, I mean, I kind of liked what they were going for. Like, one, uh, once they got to, like, the it, it, two and three have the same issue. It's like, the, the characters are decent, but we don't spend enough time with them. But then it's like, once we get to the end and, like, we get to, like, either the uh, slasher shark portion, it gets fun. And then mm-hmm. um, in the third one, like, whenever it's, like, trying to save these people, like, underneath uh, in, the undergra- in the underwater tubes, that could have been the whole movie. And it's like, that was cool. So it's like, both movies kind of do the exact same thing. Uh, but just end up being just very kind of meh, like kind of shoulder shrugs of uh, movies, you know, I don't know. Um, it, it's like the, each one kind of does the wrong thing. And then so by the time I got to this one, you know, my expectations were low. So I don't know if I was like, you know what, this ain't so bad, actually. This one, you know, I got I got some enjoyment out of um, this kind of <laughs> this might be bold to say uh it comes the closest in spirit to the original and what i mean Ooh. by that is is with the like this one focusing on the people i wasn't mad at it because i was mm-hmm. like i like what's going on here ellen and hoagie they're cute i like it like i and i like the the plight with you know with like michael the way that that's affecting him uh that's even seeing his mom date is affecting him more than his little brother getting killed like a few days ago yeah. um, which is kind of funny but like it's also like a very like kid thing like that's when you're mm-hmm. like a kid and you're like oh mom's dating a new guy and you're mm. like getting feeling all weird about it. but it's like this is a grown-ass adult feeling this way so it's like yep. the the kind of the soapy like the this the the series in general is very soapy like in the way mm-hmm. that it like focuses on the characters and you know is again like you guys said it's a drama guest starring a shark um it, you know that the whole series kind of goes in that way but this one, I'm like, you what? know what? The, the characters actually worked in this one enough. Right. And this one la- is the one that does lack the shark the most. Like, a lot of the shark set pieces just don't really work. Or would any this, tension whatsoever. <laughs> would this movie be better if the shark was a bartender and it was giving out romantic advice to Ellen? I mean, yes, of course, that would be great. But does I mean, she still spirit with a, does she still spirit spear the bartender with her with her with the bow of the ship? It it's, depends. It's, oh, yes, <laughs> it, it depends yeah. on how the relationship with Hoagie proceeds. This is like, all just a drunken dream of her. Yeah. But then, like, I mean, yes, that would have worked. Or this movie would have been much better if it uh, kept mm-hmm. going with the thing insinuating that Ellen has a psychic link with this shark. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. At that point, if we would have kept going in that direction, that that's the yeah. Jaws movie I want. <laughs> mm-hmm. so, yeah, I I will say for me, like the movie's reputation definitely preceded it prior to me watching it like and it definitely muddies the waters um two summers ago like on a whim i tried doing like a rewatch of the entire series and obviously jaws i rewatch every year uh, it's just like a summertime movie i'm gonna throw on no matter what it is like the definitive fourth of july movie 
and Jaws 2. I'm like, all right, it's good. Not as good as you remember. I've actually come. It's like I had your reaction, I think, Devon, or I'm like, yeah, this movie's pretty mid. Although I'll say like the last time I watched it, it did click into place and I appreciated it a lot more. Jaws 3 is rough. It is super rough. And watching Jaws 4 last night, I'm like, you know, I like this more than three, like watching. I couldn't get past the first act of Jaws Four the first time I tried watching it two years ago. I'm like, after Sean gets eaten and I'm like, eh, this is so bad. And I just shut it off. I'm like, I, I've got there's life is short. And, you know, my days are in this planet are numbered. I have to do other things. And I watch it twice for this show, including last night. I'm like, you know, this is actually better than three. Oh, and I know yeah. that's kind of damning it with fate praise, but there are mm-hmm. things I do like. And it is a franchise killer. I mean, there has not been another Jaws movie since then, since this. There really hasn't been any talk about remaking Jaws. Like it, every now and then it pops up and then it's quickly laughed off. I'm kind of fascinated by Joseph Sargent, the director of this movie. And we'll talk about that in the making of. But I will say, like, just assuming that Jaws is the best shark movie of all time. What are some other shark movies? Because Jaws is like, it's kind of like The Exorcist, where The Exorcist is held on such a high tableau, such a high platform that every other Exorcist movie like really pales by comparison. Like you can never escape its shadow. And Jaws is kind of the same way. In a way that like Halloween, for as much as we love that movie, Halloween is not that. Um, what are some of the other like go to shark movies for both of you? I mean, I mean, there's definitely some. I mean, there's still there's definitely some really good shark movies because I'll say like as much as I do like I, I I think Jaws is great and and what it's done for the history of film is like one thing, but like as a film, I'm like it's a four out of five for me. I don't think it's like I don't love okay. it or anything. Like I think it's great. So like I don't mm-hmm. think the the bar is as high I suppose for yeah. for shark movies, but um uh, some of my other uh, I mean recently The Shallows I really love that one, um mm-hmm. you know just Blake Lively like acting against a, a seagull for most of the movie um and is riveting uh, the shark in that movie is a total asshole they have like a great like uh chemistry between them in a way like so like uh, I I give the Shallows like actually quite a bit of credit um and then. Um, I mean, I really like that one. And then, I mean, of course, Deep Blue Sea. I mean, Deep Blue Sea is really great. Like, it's fun. Mm-hmm. It's campy. But it is also just like, that's like a, a real fun. Like, I really love those 90s. Uh, yeah. uh, the 90s era of creature features like that. Anaconda. Like, give me those movies uh, all day. Yes. So, uh, so uh, yeah. So, Shells and Deep Blue Sea would be my uh, next two favorite shark movies. Yeah. It feels yeah, like I- the 90s was the last time as a society, we were collectively in a pretty good mood. Yeah. We could do things like that. <laughs> You're absolutely right. That's a, it does feel like that a lot. Um, I would say early 2000s, too. There were uh, a series of movies called Shark Attack, mm-hmm. which are, the first one has Casper Van Dien, so that tells you how they're going to go. Oh, yeah. Um, but, <laughs> but awesome. like, it's they're gonna go so awesome. much fun. <laughs> they're fun. It's they're just fun. Like they're just fun movies. Like the third one is a Megalodon and like it, it has John Barrowman and you literally watch a very bad CGI shark swallow a boat. And it's like, <laughs> and it's about the bad guys on. So you're just like, Oh, cool. <laughs> like, <Excellent. like laughs> um, but yeah, uh, deep blue sea, I think is the undisputed secondary mm-hmm. champ of, shark movies um just because it's so much fun like it is a lot everything like everything from uh you know just everything in that movie is just so much fun about it like having sharks that are smarter than the people which is literally (laughs) everyone in that movie um (laughs) you have ll cool j and his parrot and they are comic gold and it just it's so much fun i, I do so, think the shallows is really good too i think you yeah. got some good picks in there i also really enjoyed the meg and i'm super excited Same. for the new meg movie Same. because i've i've read the books so like the first one has like nothing to do with the books other than the name of a character um but like this one i think is going more for 
the horror aspect of it, which I'm mm-hmm. very excited for. Ben I Beasley. hope so. Reckon, ben, yeah. Kill List, A Field yeah. in England, <laughs> High Rise. I think the he with the Fight Seers. <laughs> Fight Seers, which has one of my all time favorite laugh out loud endings to a movie. I highly recommend Sightseers. It is such a, it is like the widest of left turns for, <laughs> and I'm very excited to see what Ben Wheatley brings to the table for the Meg too. All right. I, I will say that I, on our guest, I trace Thurman's recommendation. I checked out 47 meters down, really enjoyed it, especially the first hour. Like they were genuinely tense and I like that, you know, not a spoiler, there's no real villain of that movie. Like, it feels like, oh, are these young women being lured out by pirates that are going to, like, leave them out there? And that's not the case, which I kind of appreciate. Um, so I enjoy that. Deep Blue Sea and The Meg, I think, are three of my favorites. But I'm going to now, let's talk about the background briefly about this movie. I have a few notes here about kind of how it came together. I will say this. The script is a very loose adaptation of Ernest Hemingway's novel, Islands in the Street, which there's a missed opportunity to have that song play here. I was, I was singing it in my head. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like, started to too. Uh... <laughs> they do use a great pop song in the dance scene that I was like singing along to it. I'm like, I remember this song from the 80s. But you have like Ellen being the grief stricken parent is a riff on the novel's protagonist of Tommy Hudson. Hoagie and Jake are stand-ins for the boat's drunken captain of the Black Deckhand that are characters in Hemingway's book. This is the only time that Jaws the Revenge screenwriter Michael Guzman will be compared to Hemingway. But it's like a very, very loose, like using the skeleton of that to adapt here. But like, I feel it though. That's the funny part. Like I actually do feel it. (laughs) And this is the second Hemingway adaptation we've covered this month for patrons or become a patron. We do a much more straightforward adaptation, 1946, The Killers by Kurt Sidemack. Steven and I talk for that about two hours. One of the best film noir movies of all time over on Patreon, which you can get, uh, you can log into our, go into our notes and become a patron today and check that out. Do it now. Pause the episode. Do it. All right. Michael Caine famously misses the Oscars and his award, collecting the award for his performance as best supporting actor in Hannah and her sisters because he's shooting this movie. He's a very good sport about it. And when he's asked at some point, he's like, I've never seen Jaws the Revenge, but I've seen the house it built and it's spectacular, which is all time, all time, an all time quote. (laughs) It's even better because it's for his mom. Yeah. Like he, the, I love that it's the house for his mom, not even his house. Love He's it. just like, I just eat my mom's house. Love my, Michael <laughs> Caine, before, like, I think, I feel like Nick Cage took notes from Michael Caine on, like, what, how to choose movie roles. Like, in terms of, like, Michael Caine did not see a script in the 80s where he was like, yeah, no, I probably should not do this. He feels very Cagean before that was a Nick Cage hallmark. I'll ask you, get gentlemen, this because I asked this to Sarah, and I, I love this question. So, Michael Caine in like a Muppet Christmas Carol, like it's the best of Christmas Carol. That's not the question. I believe that Michael Caine was completely fucked up on peyote for all of a Muppet Christmas Carol, and thought the Muppets were real and was just reacting to them like they were real. Do you believe this to be the case? I like to believe this is the case. He's given he's giving some unhinged in that movie. Uh, <laughs> there, there, he's on something. That's for damn sure. Yeah. Uh, I, Michael Caine doesn't take me like a peyote guy. Uh, he he kind of seems like maybe a like a like a little quick ketamine before before a mm-hmm. scene. Uh, that's the vibes he gives me, and that's the uh, vibes <laughs> that performance in that movie is giving me. But I disagree. It's the best Christmas Carol movie. Yeah. It- and it's funny that you actually mentioned this because I just saw. Did you say you Twitter. disagree that it's the best Christmas no. Carol? It's oh. not the. That's not the conversation, Mike. <laughs> you gotta be funny. <laughs> it's funny because like that, that a... didn't register. I'm like, did he say it's not? All right, we'll save that. For... All right, we'll take this to Slack later. I'm sorry, yeah, Sean. 
I was gonna say no, it's all good. I honestly almost forgot what I was talking about because uh, I did. It took a second for me to like process that. Wow, that it um, you you're so convert so controversial yet so brave uh <laughs> um i was just gonna say that meme has it's funny you mentioned that because that meme has come out and it was like uh michael kane is acting like all the muppets are like real people mm -hmm. and tim curry is acting like he is a muppet so they're the best performances <laughs> in any of the Muppet <laughs> movies so it's just it's funny that you mentioned that because i was thinking about this literally today <laughs> excellent so I, I choose, this is my truth. I choose to believe it. So Joseph Sargent is tapped to direct. And this is what's fascinating. This is like not a well-directed movie. Like the action sequences in this are terrible. And Sargent is fascinating because it, in the seventies, he directs, I think what might be one of the best height movie, heist movies of all time. He does the taking of Pelham one, two, three, starring Walter Matthau, Jerry Stiller and Robert Shaw of Jaws fame. It, to me, is to this day, like, one of the most thrilling movies I've ever seen. And it's one who's, like, solving the crime, like, hinges on a sneeze. I mean, to the, it's fascinating. He then just directs, like, a lot of made-for-TV track, like, a lot of the... And then this movie. But after this, two years later, he directs a TV movie called Day One, which is an, a, a made-for-TV movie about the Manhattan Project, which comes out the same year as Paul Newman and John Cusack's Fat Man and Little Boy, um, which is terrible. Uh, that's like a one and a half star movie for me. But it is like a fairly faithful adaptation of like what happened with the Manhattan Project. It wins an Emmy for like the best drama and comedy mini miniseries of 1989. Guessing it was more of a drama than a comedy. Uh, I'm just kind of going, but it stars like Brian Dennehy in that movie. I mean, it's like a who's who. It's like David Strathane, who would play uh, Oppenheimer twice. Uh, he would also play him in like a PBS recreation of like the trials of Oppenheimer. And I think Nolan has him in like an uncredited cameo in, in the new Oppenheimer uh, to get him in there three times. Like it's a great, you know, it looks amazing. I haven't seen it, but it's one of those things where I need to seek this out and watch it. Uh, Cause like the bits I watched on YouTube, like Dennehy is going for it. It's congratulations. We somehow got Oppenheimer in the doors say, for the revenge. We did uh, it. Was, we did it guys. I, <laughs> but it's timely. I to... It makes sense. <laughs> no, like, it's just so funny. <laughs> how are you going to bring Barbie? We need to figure out how we bring Barbie in. No. <laughs> Okay, I probably, in a tragic way, could when we talk about uh, the young actress. So Sargent does film in the vineyard briefly, February 2nd through February 9th of 1987. Uh, it's the first time in about two decades that like Jaws was filmed in quote unquote Amity. And in a really nice bit of continuity, like Lee Fierro returns as Mrs. Kittner and, to comfort like Ellen at her son's wake. So you have that kind of like closing the loop there. And Fierro said like, yeah, they asked, they paid me like a lot of money to be in this movie, like a pretty ridiculous sum for as small as the role is. So she's like, I thought it would be a good movie, but nope. She says, I was wrong. It's so funny. Um, it's so funny. They were like so thirsty to like get everybody back. Like they yeah. were trying so hard. So I look, I feel like they only offered her that much because this mm -hmm. was like maybe after uh, Dreyfus and uh, Scheider said no. And then they're like, OK, yeah. we need at least one returning person. Yeah. Just give her whatever. <laughs> so they <laughs> good for her. Back, good for her is what I'm saying. They bring back the woman who's like, that's not funny. That's not funny at all. And I think like a couple others. A couple, like one of the selectmen is now like credited as the mayor of Amityville. Yeah, so they, because um, they would have brought back like Maury Hamilton, but like he had passed away in 86 from cancer, tragically, which is really sad. Also, one thing I think is just so funny, this movie in the credits, they spell Mrs. Kintner's her name wrong. <laughs> I believe that. <laughs> yeah, it's just Mrs. Kintner in, 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 the, in the credits and her name is Mrs. Kintner and jaws so i was just like Excellent. yeah this kind of describes where you're at <laughs> they had that kind of the attention <laughs> to detail um the original idea like they do actually ask roy scheider to come back 
They're like, look, here is a, it's kind of like Han Solo coming back for a force awakens. Like he comes back to die. Like that's why Harrison Ford is like, I'll come back if you kill me off. So they tell Shider, like, look, here's the idea. Like, you're going to get eaten by the shark in the opening scene. And Shider is like, love it. I'll do it. Give me a million bucks. That's my asking price. And they're like, what? It's like, yeah, a million bucks and I'll do it. And that would have translated to like $110,000 a day. So they're like, eh, we'll just hire someone for like scale and he can play your son, Sean. So like that doesn't happen. Yeah, um, but like, uh, could you imagine this movie if they would have brought them back and did that? That, that would have been like, awful. That, that, yeah, that would have been, been amazing. That would have been amazing. I think it would have been, it, it, I think it's going to be a bit of both because it is such a disservice to the first two movies, but it's also like, that would shock audiences. Mm-hmm. Like, crazy shock. <laughs> yeah. Like, your star of two movies who has faced two sharks just gets like eaten in the first 10 minutes of this movie mm-hmm. like that 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 would be i mean that, i would, would the word of mop alone would make it a bigger hit i mean I, I would i would take that versus uh them killing him off screen uh due to let me check my notes fear uh ellen said he died of fear uh mm-hmm. off screen so uh yeah so i i i would have not felt betrayed at all i've been like yes this is this is I, new jaws there we go i can see that point i can concede that point i just i think that would have been awful i really think <laughs> that, that would have been like fucking terrible like you could have been honest i just been like your dad spent 12 hours a day in the beating sun well, like chain smoking Chesterfield Kings, like his heart exploded in his chest. So that's what did him in. And, you know, like that would have been it. And he never went to the doctor because it was on the mainland and he didn't right. smoke anymore. <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> so he never got checked out. Uh, he just, he just, he, I'm sorry, he just died. Right. So Jake, who's played by Mario Van Peoples in the original matter of fact, the original cut of the movie, he's eaten by the shark. Like when you see him in the shark's mouth bloody and you're like, well, he's dead. You would be correct. Um, the scene of him surviving and swimming back to the shore that is actually shot like after Jaws bombs in the theater on that first weekend. Uh, like the Lance guest talks about getting a call from Joe Sargent being like, how do you feel about coming down to Malibu to shoot another ending to the movie? And guest is like, the movie's in the theaters. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's like, we're bringing Van Peoples back. Like the people want peoples. They have spoken. And that is added into like the foreign releases of the movie and the TV cuts. I've never heard of that before ever. That is, that's kind of amazing, but also like, it's so funny because like I remember like like I literally kept it as I was typing because I was like oh no I was like they kill him off and then I was like I was like oh he's back I was like on one hand I hate that everybody lives in this movie mm-hmm. but two at the same time I was like I was gonna be real upset if they did you know not only had to make him the the sassy Bahaman uh, uh, side character but then also kill him off I was yeah. gonna be very upset so I'm glad yeah. they did this <laughs> I am yeah, yeah. it it. it it's something yeah there um there's a book actually written about this movie called the shark is roaring um Hmm. that i bought and in it they said sin scheinberg said um in jaws of revenge official official soundtrack booklet that the only thing wrong with the film is the ending the impact of the shark dying and mario van peebles dying was too much for uh, the audience in one finale People were sad the shark died. What did they think of him? I was going to say, really quickly on the Shider thing, the only thing that would have been more fucked up is if like Rocky dies at the end of Rocky Five, which was the original uh, ending. Like that's the original end of Rocky Five is Tommy the Gun beats Rocky to death in the streets. Like that was the end. Like that would have been awful. Oh, oh, that's that's next up on my. I'm I'm literally watching that one tomorrow. Whenever I Rocky uh, Five, yeah, it's up. It's next up on my Rocky binge. <laughs> I think we're gonna do a patron Rocky month. Uh, we'll go all through the Rocky and Creed movies in 2024. But that's 
neither here nor there. I fucking love Rocky. <laughs> All right, that sorry. Too, so much fun. <laughs> so I put a note in here. It feels like to me, like because Rocky three. I mean, Rocky three <laughs> is amazing. I almost said Rocky three is terrible. Rocky three is amazing. Um, Jaws three is not amazing. It is a minor hit, but not. It, it makes like less than half of what Part Two does, and like uh, one fifth of the original. So it feels like this movie is kind of created because Universal knows they have a ride coming out. Like they are planning Universal Studios Florida opening. So I did have some notes here about Jaws the Ride, and originally, like if you go to Universal Hollywood there is like a tram ride that just takes you through all the park. And it's like, here's the psycho house. Here's the shark from jaws. And that was the original idea. They were going to do that. But then they said, you know, we have a tram ride here in Hollywood. Disney world has the MGM tram ride now doing their kind of nostalgia tour of like backlot sets. We don't want to copy Disney. Let's just do a kind of theme park. And Jaws the Ride was one of the centerpieces and like George Lucas and Steven Spielberg are involved with like designing and giving creative input on these rides and Jaws the Ride. It's the centerpiece attraction when Universal opens in the late spring, early summer of 1990. And the ride itself is pretty cool. You can actually find some footage of it online. It's a platoon boat shark ride. Uh, and where the shark, it's a platoon boat ride where the shark like would literally jump out of the water and bite the boat and attack it like and spin the boat around when you're on the ride the captain would shoot the captain being like your minimum wage making like college student working <laughs> there for the summer would shoot the shark with a quote-unquote grenade launcher and it would spray blood everywhere like up through the water Uh, Just like in the end of the first movie, that was the end of the ride. Like you would blow the shark up and the shark could swim at like 20 feet a second. And very much like the first Jaws movie, it's a fucking disaster. The shark (laughs) doesn't work. Uh, It got to the point where Universal would tell people the ride was closed, even when it wasn't. For some reason, they used real shark teeth in the fake shark. And when it would bite the boat, and this is like not a like, it always bit the boat. It would just miss the boat completely like <laughs> with whiff. But every now and then it would bite the boat for real and then damage it because of the boats are really flimsy. I mean, At one point, yeah, sorry. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, it uh, sounds very obvious. I mean, uh, we obviously know by the story of this movie that they didn't watch Jaws 3, but like this also sounds so much like, you know, them doing all these bad ideas in this, you know, amusement park with this uh, with this machine. So it's like a uh, life imitating art, imitating life. Even better. At one point, a father of like four falls out of the ride. And is in like the deep part of the water. Like at one point, it's like 10 feet deep. Everywhere is about four. And he says the shark is coming at him. And yes, it's a fake shark. It is still a 2,500 pound piece of mechanical equipment. So he yeah, sues. Don't put me down. <laughs> no, yeah, fuck that. He <laughs> sues Universal for like a million bucks and they uh, settle out of court. Um, so in two and a half months and after spending $33 million, which I just want to point out is more than the budget of any of the Jaws movies. Matter of fact, it's more than the budget of like the first. Nope, that's not true. But it is more than any budget of any singular Jaws movie. They shut the ride down. They close it down. They sue the company that is that makes it for them. Uh, and I think the company has said like, look, if we gave this to like Disney World, they would know how to make it work. Like you guys are a bunch of rubes that don't know how to run theme park rides, which yikes. So they retool the ride. They hire a company called uh, Totally Fun, the Totally Fun Company, which is awesome. And they redo the ride and it's different. So they still have um, grenade launchers, but they you know, don't actually hit the shark. They cause explosions. So there's like these massive, like fiery explosions that patrons would say like, holy shit, like this is burning us. Like it is wicked hot. Um, TV screens would play like when you're waiting in line, similar to what you do now. 
the ride would take you through Amity. It would show you Chief Brody's house. And then you would get like a mayday. There was like a sinking boat distress signal. And like Chief Brody would say, we'll be there in 10 minutes, at which point your captain would say, like, we'll be shark bait in 10 minutes. Um, and the ride ends with the shark coming out of the water and, it would, and like biting an electrical cable and like getting fried. You would see it fried. It was actually looked really fun. Like there's you can find video of it online there's like and the dude who's like do you know the kind of host of it is like having a wicked good time doing it i might actually throw some footage up of it like some like some audio uh it runs for a number of years but it's eventually replaced by harry potter and the escape from grin grid gods like the jaws ride is shut down when you go to universal now the only thing you can see is like the great white that's hanging up on like the hook uh, mm. as a kind of a memento i love universal studios like it's literally my happy place like i i am like a kid in a candy store there but um i never got to ride the jaws ride i would say the successor to it is like there's a jurassic park ride that's like also a very slow moving like boat ride that has like died a roaring dinosaur and then like one steep drop at the end of it which this jaws ride doesn't have so. Yeah, I was going to say, I remember seeing Universal in all of their, like, VHS and DVDs, like, in the early 2000s, like, late 90s, early 2000s, they all would have, like, a little trailer. Some of them would have a trailer for Universal theme parks. Oh, yeah, yeah. And I remember the bite, like, the shark bite, and I was just like, oh, I want to go on that so yeah. bad. <laughs> awesome. I was like, that was just, like, incredible. Like, yeah. I don't... And, Yes, they may have been minimum wage paid, but like if I got to shoot a shark with a grenade launcher, even for pretend, yeah, like life made. <laughs> yeah. I say, listeners, Google AMA Skipper Jaws ride. Like one of the guys who like did, he said twenty thousand trips on that. Like as one of the employees did a really fun AMA. Uh, ask me anything with like and they would talk about like different stories from the ride and like how the fun he had kind of like captain i would definitely seek that out for a good read he's an honorary ahab like honorary virus yeah (laughs) okay so this movie is released july 17th 1987 and i just want to point out filming started february 2nd so that is insane for a turnaround right oh my god it it debuts in third place behind robocop in a re-release of snow white and the seven dwarfs okay so it is like the flash or the dial of destiny of its day basically in that it makes like seven million bucks its first weekend half of what jaws 3d made it is out of the top 10 by week three it's at number 12 worldwide it pulls in like 52 million on a 23 million dollar budget so it's not a flop but clearly the wind is gone from this movie at this point like the franchise is dead it's disappointing (laughs) the wind is gone the voodoo is here yeah i think it (laughs) oh that is the other thing like the whole (laughs) the whole like how does this shark there's a, a it's cut from the movie, but it's in the novelization that someone for some reason has placed a voodoo curse on the Brody family. And that's why this shark is like attacking and following them, which is. You know what See, they should have done? Because there was a there was a line too where Michael says that, and like it's just like a throwaway right. line. And I was like, yeah. wait, I was like, what's he talking about? I was like, is he just saying that? Yeah. And oh, so he yeah. was alluding to something. So they should have had it be Mrs. Kintner be the one who put this voodoo yes. curse on them because then, wow. Oh, wow. <laughs> and then she like follows, she comes with her down to the Bahamas, and that's why the shark follows. And there's oh, the revenge. You, that, that would make <laughs> sense. Then the revenge, like at the end of the movie, if she hosts her son's corpse up, it's like this is for my boy. Um, you mean like the be... one leg they found? Yeah. <laughs> Just... <laughs> That's that's, that's right. They did not find much. They did not find a lot of it. Um, that is She's true. wearing a, well, a jacket made of the of the of the pool floaters. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, it, you're kind of like, hey, when you, if they kept the voodoo curse in, 
even if the shark died at the end, you'd still have to figure like, well, the curse is still on. Like there are other things you like if they all celebrate at the end and then you just see a cutaway to like a hand holding a doll and then another hand holding a giant pin and it like sticks it through a thing of Ellen and she drowns. She screams and then drowns like that would have been a choice. It would have been uh, and that would have been wild. But I'm also yeah. glad I think that was another sidestepping of, you know, Islander stereotypes to like kind of include mm-hmm. that in here. So uh, it would have been wild, though. It would have been. So let's talk about this movie. And let's talk about stuff that works for a moment. Because, you know, it, it's there's not a lot, so it might be quick. The Michael chase scene. Like, Michael, when he's in the little... When he's, like, getting attacked and he's in that kind of underwater... Um, like protective gear and then has to swim away from the shark and make his way through a submarine. That stuff is genuinely pretty good, isn't it? Like, Sean, what were your thoughts on that? Yeah, that's the only sense of tension in this entire Mm -hmm. movie. (laughs) Like, it's kind of undone by how the shark looks but like sure it, it, in this in the scene itself like this is the only part where i was just like oh this is good like this is creepy um mm-hmm. and it it's very well it like it's not well done as the sh- like because you unfortunately see the shark <laughs> um, yeah. but if you if just everything else with it i do think there is a sense of tension and i do think the scene where like right at the end of it where it breaks through like the wall and gets like yep. trapped by that ladder. That's creepy. Like that's probably the scariest part of this entire movie, which has literally no tension in it. Yeah. At any other part. <laughs> yeah. That and it like coming through like the submarine door where you're like, all right, well it can't get through that. And then it actually does. And that mm. like we talked about how Jaws three was just in the tunnels, how tense that would be kind of like, swimming through this submarine where it's like very constricted, like you don't have a lot of maneuverability and you're basically getting funneled from one end to the other. And knowing that like Sean has been eaten, you kind of get the feeling like, you know, when Lance Guest ain't no Roy Scheider. So you get this feeling that no, the Michael's not exactly safe. Like it wouldn't be shocking if he were eaten in this movie. I mean, I I like the chasing, except I was like still thinking to myself like, when yeah, the the look at the shark like whenever because they like they show it moving, but it's not moving though. It's just like kind of like just like gliding in direction yeah. uh, after him, and just the idea that Michael could outswim it by like pushing himself off of rocks as he swims mm-hmm. is uh, hilarious. But I was like, you know, go for it. But honestly. I think the opening scene when Sean dies is like one of the, I I think, I think the opening scene of this where Sean dies is better than anything in Jaws three by far. Um, Agree. And I think it's like a a really nice, nicely done sequence. I think it's a a cool kind of bait and switch with, um, you know, you get to reintroduce Sean and like Sean's like super charismatic and they're having like a, you know, he has a nice little dynamic with Ellen and uh, they're having, you know, just like little family times. And like you're set, they're setting him up to be like, oh, yeah, look, he's just like his dad. He's the sheriff and all the things. And then to kill him off first and then on top of it being a Jaws Christmas movie. And the idea, like, like he sells it really well of, like, the, like, terror of him, like, trying to scream so bad, yeah. but then there's just the Christmas carols so nobody can hear him. Like, that's pretty, like, creepy and, like, tense for me. Like, I was just like, oh, my God, I fucking hate Christmas carolers already, and then now this? <laughs> I was like, that would suck. Like, that, like, like, and him having to register that, too, because first you think they, like, just eats him off the ship, and then, and then you see him come back up, and he's, like, still alive for, like, another, like, couple minutes. So it's like he's registering all this and, like, yeah. the fact of, of how hopeless it is. So, like, I really like that, uh, the, the opening kill, like, quite a bit. I agree. I had that down here too. And I'll say this, the actual attack itself, I think is like poorly done. Like you, it's really edited. I mean, you know what's happening, but you don't, it's very like 2000s new metal or it really like, we're going to be talking about the saw movies for the next few months. It has (laughs) that like that jangly editing that shot that, that, 
Saw has, just not nearly as well. But I do think like him screaming when he notices his arm is gone <laughs> and you just have that bloody stump. It's kind of like Georgie in it. OK. Um, and then you cut from that to like everybody just singing Christmas carols on the dock, like everybody's enjoying their Christmas and you cut back to him screaming and then at it ending up in the water. Like that is genuinely scary and sad. And I think like it would be, you know, one of the problems with these movies and following the Brodies is like in all four movies, the Brodies are paid played by four different sets of actors. So you never get any cohesion they're just like call that. It'd be like if you recast like Chief Brody and they're like, well, we're going to have Chief Brody die in this movie and Roy Scheider's not coming back. So like, get me Tommy Lee Jones, like have him come in. You know, that would be really, <laughs> it'd be really weird, right? <laughs> that would be such, I mean, they both look slightly grizzled um but slightly grizzled yeah i was gonna say i think you had it right when you said that uh roy scheider looks like like leather shoe leather he does (laughs) yeah yeah, oh and jaws 2 he is so leathery i don't think tommy lee jones could pull off like the full leather (laughs) shoe leather I mean, yeah, it's tough. I mean, I guess it's, you know, they kind of try to get away with it with like the different ages. But then, yeah, it's just I mean, it's already just that that confusion with um, if you, you know, you're watching this. And then especially like when it came out, they were like marketing as like the third movie in the great Jaws legacy. And people are like, but Jaws, and they're like, but Jaws 3 and they're like, shh. shh, shh. We're not talking about that. So it's like, so yeah, just the, the confusion there. But I, I will say uh, I, I like Michael and Sean better in this one than I do in Jaws 3 also. Ooh. Yeah, I agree. I do not. I do I, not. I think Mike is awful. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, <laughs> well, Dennis Quaid is great in 3. Like it, for, for all the drugs that he's on, uh, you know, he's he is a solid Michael. But like I, I, I still give this one like he, he has a little bit of an emotional – uh, uh, work to do in this one, and I, I yeah. kind of appreciated it. Yeah, Dennis Quaid is so distracting in part three because I don't know he he does have that manic coke energy that is just like like I jo- like one of my favorite jokes uh, that I've said because I like to rank my jokes is like Texas Chainsaw Two, like Dennis Hopper was not cast in that movie he just wandered on set and started doing shit and toby hooper was like fuck it roll the cameras right like that's how i feel tilda swinton gets all her jobs again like if we did like a you know how i think devon you recently did like a a, uh march madness like ranking of horror movies yeah did all the remakes yeah yeah if you did that next year but did like most coked out performances (laughs) in a movie (laughs) Dennis Quaid in Jaws 3 and Dennis Hopper in Texas Chainsaw 2, they're your number one seeds. Like they're your Gonzagas, they're your UNCs, they are your um, Kentuckys of coked can, out performances. Can I throw one in there? Mm-hmm. Hart Bachner and Die Hard. Oh, literally and figuratively. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um. Sorry, he's always he's always in the running for me. Honestly. I am. <laughs> I'm not. I just made a little note. Coked out performances. <laughs> bracket. I think we need to do this. Okay. Um, so Mitchell Anderson, who plays uh, Sean Brody in this, like he. I mean, Joseph Sargent must have liked working with him because he gives Mitchell the lead role of Richard Carpenter in like the made for TV movie, the Carpenter story, uh, which is what he, I'm sorry, the Karen Carpenter story, which uh, Sergeant directed, I think in 89. Um, And he gives Mitchell like the lead role. I think his, probably his best role, like he's in like 51 episodes of Doogie Howser. He did a lot of TV work. He hasn't really, well, actually is recently as 2022. He's in like a couple dozen episodes of the show uh after forever like he's one of the performers which i've never heard of but it's like the first thing he had done in 20 years like after like leaving party of five 
so yeah mitchell anderson do you think sean is very childlike in this movie though like he's kind of he's like we're going to buy presents and we're gonna wrap them and we're gonna have a real is he doing that because like dad is dead or i mean is he just like a giant baby i mean i think they're really trying to like again like since they know that they're gonna like be killing him off so fast i think they're like trying to do like really fast work to like be like see he's so Mm -hmm. likable look you know he's doing great at the thing he's got his wife he's uh doing the christmas stuff and like so like i feel like they're just like kind of doing double time to like make you Mm -hmm. like him uh and just like try to make him like just like as uh charismatic and likable as possible for his you know brief 12 minutes in this film do you think sorry you first no uh, sorry mike i was just gonna say but i do say i think you're absolutely right i do think they it does feel like a little bit like sean's kind of like compensate for the fact that his dad's not there yeah so he's very much like hey like let's have the greatest christmas ever like you know like it's like yeah death dead but like we're still gonna have fun like i'm here i love you like Ha, ha, ha. Or or showing <laughs> that he can be the sheriff and still be with his family too, like unlike like his dad, like being like, see, I can do both. Like I, so it's like also like maybe kind of a, a defying thing too of sure. you know him taking his dad's job, but then like still uh, making an effort to be like, no, see, I am still doing family stuff. See, it can be done. So Devon, I like how you just said this movie is kind of working like double time, and I wonder, like as you say that, if if this would work a little bit better, if it did a little bit of what Jaws 2 did, and Jaws 2 does move quick. Like you get four bodies in the first 20 minutes, but there's that scene where the shark like swims into the lagoon and you know that it's there, but nobody else does. If you had something like that, where maybe for like 15 minutes, you feel the presence of the shark there. And then at the end of act one, like 25 minutes in, that's when Sean bites it and you then can maybe cut some of the stuff in the Bahamas that feels like a bit extraneous. But if you had like that more of a buildup that, Oh, the shark is, you know, in the waters and no one is aware of it. If that would maybe build some of that tension that, you know, really worked well in the first couple jaws movies. I mean, I mean, yeah, I mean, functionally, I mean, I think they really could just could have when we're in the Bahamas, I think we just could have got more shark stuff in general. I think it's just Mm -hmm. like because I feel like the opening works like super well. And then like you really do feel this absence of the shark uh, for for a good stretch of the movie. And and but it's also like it feels like, again, like it's the the movie doubling down that like it's like it's so funny that like every time we like get to a Jaws sequel, we're like, okay, but now let's do less of the people and more shark. And then they're like, no, 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 we still want the people. So it's like, I feel like in this one, this is the doubling down. Like, no, this is a series about people. It's not about the shark, damn it. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, because they really do take their time and like, uh, you know, like they have, you know, Ellen trying to process the death. And then they are really trying to like lean into this like psychological Mm -hmm. aspect that like both of them have. You know, she is like, you know, all obviously, you know, psychologically distraught about it. But then uh, and then you have Michael, on the other hand, that like, you know, is like. Uh, you know, choosing to ignore his feelings about the way that uh, the sharks have affected his family and all these different things. Um, so it's like they're, they're really doubling down on being like, no, we are going to get down to the, the you know, the psychology and emotions of these characters. And like, you will wait for the shark shit, you know? So it's like, it, yeah. uh, that's kind of but the vibes so they give me. <laughs> it's just so extraneous though. Like, yes, there is a difference between like character development and like, and like building your characters and just kind of being boring and mm-hmm. there's so many scenes with the humans in this that i'm just like it's why did we need this why did we need the gambling scene or like why is the gambling thing even a plot in this? <laughs> like why is like why why is like there's so much like why is you know like the welding scene like where i got that quote i swear i'm i i mean i wouldn't say no to to making love to an angry welder but that is a quote from the movie (laughs) but that scene really has nothing to do with anything i like and it doesn't have any reaper it doesn't have any repercussions other than the fact that like carla just kind of hates her life angry (laughs) yeah she's kind of angry all the time he he literally like michael literally asked his wife carla like why are we arguing and it doesn't necessarily feel like it's a moment 
between two characters. You almost think that like Lance Gass thought Sergeant yelled cut and he's looking <laughs> at the other performer going, uh, I need some motivation. Like, why are we arguing? Because it's so, they're so inert. Um, I mean, the it, one thing that comes across in this movie is Carla's like seething hatred of her husband, Michael, and her life in general. Yeah, she she's I mean, it, not only her, but it's just like I feel like all the stuff that they do with her and the stuff that they do with Jake is just like show how like insensitive all the people around Michael are mm-hmm. to like, hey, he just like lost his brother to another shark related thing. Like, hey, he's going through some stuff and then. And it's like, even though, even if he's not talking about it, you know he's going through some shit. And yet they just sure. don't care. They keep mentioning the sharks all the time. They're cracking jokes. They're like, you know, she's getting mad at him over the fucking garbage. And it's just like, mm-hmm. yo, like, leave this dude alone a little bit. So it's yeah. like, and, and that's why I'm like, if we're going to do that with both of these characters, we didn't need any of like all the extra stuff with him and Jake. Like we, we like all the Thank stuff you. with him and Jake and like the science and research they're doing is so uninteresting. I don't know what they're oh doing God. and it is so boring. So if like you're not doing something cool science related, then let's go ahead and get that out of here. Like at least in Jaws 3, I liked the plight between like them as SeaWorld, but then the, the Australian dude that they hire. And like all mm-hmm. the conflict there, at least they had that going and like that extra stuff. But in this, it's like oh. all this time with uh, Michael and Jake is like, what? What are we doing here? Like, I no. <laughs> Jaws three gives you a time traveling Aaron Eckhart to come back and play the role of like the British rogue, <laughs> while Dennis Quaid designs theme parks. And this Michael, he's gone from in a few sh- scant years designing the underground theme parks to uh tagging snails so they can track their mating habits and i already fell asleep twice typing that out in my notes like he does something with snails and like i woke up it's two hours later i have a hot pocket wrapper on my face like it is the dullest shit like why are we and maybe that's like the energy that lance guest rings because like they were trying to make lance guest happen in the <laughs> 80s like he's jimmy the the creepy yeah. paramedic in halloween 2 he's in the last starfighter he's in this and it's like guys lance guest is not no one ever said like oh thank god lance is here the party can yeah. start now <laughs> and like it doesn't help that like the character of michael is written he's He's not a great character. Like, he's really not. He, the fact that a great white shark shows up to the Bahamas after you told your mother that they don't come there. Mm -hmm. Like, even if you don't believe her, tell her that. And be like, hey, you might be kind of right. I'm going to stay out of the water for a while. Like, yeah. And then he doesn't tell anyone. And then, so, and I know we, we kind of shed a little bit on Carla, but I actually like Carla in this movie. I think she's mm-hmm. more believable. She's a, a kind of a believable wife, uh, especially when, like, they, t- when he comes in and is like, what happened? And they're all like, it was almost eaten by a shark. And he, he's like, oh, I should have known this would happen. And she's like, what? Yes. <laughs> and she's just she angry. Really and we get stepped nothing in that out of one. He was, yeah. he was so yeah. casual about it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Like, she is it's screaming at him. Just... Yeah. I was going to say, but once, once Ellen leaves the island, they got a divorce. Like, oh, yeah. Like, there's no way she stayed with him. Yeah. The... There is, I don't know if it's couples counseling. Like, it, she is so angry that at one point I I half expected her to blurt out the shark ate the wrong brother, right? I really expected <laughs> her because like there is so much rage. Oh, we know and, she was thinking it. That's exactly what. Oh she, yeah. Well, I mean, why do you think at the end when she's leaving, she goes take care of Jake? Like she didn't even say like I love you or anything. She was well, just like bye. Yeah, I'm gone. That's what I wanted to leave these two on. I, I want to compare like in Jaws when Ellen and Chief Brody have their goodbye and like Ellen is written out of the movie with an hour to go. Like they have like a very sweet 10, like did you pack your galoshes? They tell jokes. I like, put your Dramamine in, 
but there's like a genuine love and concern for one another. And then in Jaws 2, like after Brody comes back like drunk after he's lost his job and he's like, I'm too, he's like, I'm too honest or whatever he says. Uh, and, and she's like, you're too drunk. That's what it is. And it's a very sweet, gentle nurture. Like that's how you kind of leave these two characters mm-hmm. in here. You never have a moment of reconciliation between caller and Mike. It's just like her screaming, like just like wailing at him as he kind of like saunters out to go on the boat. Like it is, it's, kind of fucked up yeah there's there's kind of no comeback from that because yeah he he was he missed her art thing because he was chasing the shark that he chose not to tell her about Mm -hmm. so yeah two for one there uh he's he's definitely uh uh, not doing too hot and yeah they they i mean it's like i like at the beginning like their kind of interactions like i i believe them at first of like the you know like the the, the little uh, back and forth they have and they're they're you know very horny there's multiple mentions of having a healthy sex life throughout mm-hmm. the movie and i'm like yeah you know yeah and, and the fact that and it's so funny they even be saying the shit in front of their daughter too it's not even like oh, uh, yeah. like you know how back in the day it used to be like oh don't say that in front of the kids like ah oh, they don't know what you're talking about so it's like i love how mm-hmm. like they are even just like so plainly just yeah. like you know like whatever but then like <laughs> yeah yep. they they don't have like that like um you know like um real uh, emotional like you know like conversation to like uh you know like really either snap him out of it or like him like you know like finally bearing his emotions to her like mm-hmm. if there was like a scene where like she's like wailing into him and then he just like breaks down in tears and just like sobs like a baby like that would have been that's really all you would have needed if like to like show yeah. like him like you know bottling all this stuff up yeah. and that would have been a great moment for him and Carla to have so like yeah I think it is definitely mm-hmm. missing that moment yeah, he doesn't. I, I will say that, like, my first note on this movie is there is a kernel of a good idea here. Like, there's this idea of, like, a woman who is, like, grieving after the sudden loss of both her, like, longtime husband and, like, the true love of her life and her son dying in a horrible accident. Like, her grieving that loss, traveling with her other son to like an exotic part of the world where she starts a tentative relationship with a very charming, very handsome scoundrel. Cause that is what Michael Caine is. Hoagie is like, he is the, if you look up the definition of scoundrel in the dictionary, Hoagie and Han Solo are fist fighting, right. To see <laughs> who's going to have their picture in there. And while that's going on, her other son is like, looking on with a lot of skeptic skepticism and not really condoning the relationship. Like there is a good movie there. There's a good romantic drama there. And it feels like that was the script. And then Sid Scheinberg said, that's cool, but where's the shark? We're going to put John, you know how like after Hellraiser three, the wine (laughs) would get all of these horror movie pitches and they'd be like, that's cool. We're just going to put Pinhead here on page 12, 20, 30. And they're not really Hellraiser movies, but Pinhead is somehow in them. Um, that's what this movie feels like. It's like, well, we're just going to insert a shark in here. And and it's the best part of the movie, uh, honestly. Like, I really like, I really love seeing like Helen or Ellen and Hoagie together and like uh, mm-hmm. the idea of like, hey, you know, uh, you know uh, how to get unsad? You get some dick. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I love that uh, sentiment. Yeah. Uh, apparently, apparently that uh, not the dick part, but Michael Caine, he really liked the script uh, on that part of being like, hey, like it's like really cool to like mm-hmm. play someone of an older age, get yeah. to you know do like a relationship, and then like kind of have like a like almost like teenager dynamic. It was it was cute. Mm-hmm. I, so like it, it definitely does. does. It is the best part. <laughs> she does play it like a teenager. There's like one point when she's confessing to Carl, like all he did was kiss me and I don't. And she's like, so giddy. And like, it's not the best acting. And I'm not going to say like, Oh, Lorraine Gary, like really brings it, you know, but it's fun and giddy. And I will say there are parts when like Michael Caine, he's like, when he's talking to Ellen and she starts having those like telepathic connections and she's talking about the shark. (laughs) 
He is definitely, you could see him doing the mental, cal- his character of Hoagie doing the calculations. Like, do I really want to, like, how much crazy is it okay to stick my dick into? Like, you can see him doing the calculations. Like, like is this too much crazy? I right? like to gamble, but is this too much? Yeah. Hey, he's you know? a gambler. He is a gambling man. Like, you could see an end to this where, like, you find out that Hoagie somehow like swindles Ellen out of like the life insurance she gets for her husband's death. And then like bets it all on black at the craps table. And like, you could see like that being like how this non jaws movie was supposed to go, but instead Hoagie flies his plane into the ocean, dives into the water and then comes up like Millhouse in the Simpsons comes up bone dry after <laughs> diving in the water. And like, why? <laughs> like, that's one of the things I've always, like, I, the, the, the finale of this has always been wonky, but like, why do they land the plane? Like, they've mm-hmm. already said where she's at. Like, they're sending people to hell. Like, literally. Like, don't he, land the plane. He, he literally <laughs> like, said, like, okay, I'm gonna do this. Like, we got the plan and they execute the plan and then he just goes, uh, yo, well, I'm just gonna go and do it. And they're like, you've never done this I before. I gonna go help her. And it was just like, wait, bro, what are you doing? Yeah, well, you, you, you're not gonna be able to fly out of the water. It was, it, but it was so funny because there was a there was a moment. I mean, I guess it was like a distraction thing, but there was a moment where he like flew in, and I thought he was just gonna hit the shark with the plane. Like I thought he was gonna fly mm-hmm. the shark, fly the plane to the shark. If this movie would did that, I, I would have been pumping my fist. It, I was <laughs> so disappointed that that was not the case. <laughs> if Hoagie does a kamikaze mission into <laughs> the shark, and that's how this movie ended. Like him, like flying solo into the shark, and there's a fiery explosion. Like four stars. Like this would have been <laughs> the best then, movie since Jaws. I imagined then, like he, punching he, he, it he, like he, with he, the he, wing is like what I imagine, but that's great too. <laughs> I could I could ex- even excuse them reusing the like exploded shark from Jaws if they did that. Like I I would have I would have just forgiven. Just a little bit. If they would have done a kamikaze mission on a shark. (laughs) Do do we like, I mean, what do we make of Hoagie's character? Like, what's his, at the end of the day, what's Hoagie's angle? Hoagie's angle is he's a good dude. Like, he's a good dude. He's also looking for some love. I, Mm -hmm. I love the recurring bit that, like, Michael just, like, keeps making all these assumptions about him. He's like, Ah, uh, you well, you know, some of those pilots fly drugs into the country, mm-hmm. or like, oh, well, he's leaving at odd times. What's he doing? And like, he's like so like skeptical of him. And it's like, I like, I like that. I'm pretty sure he's just like a goofy good dude. Like, he's just like, ah, oh, yeah. He's like, you know, yeah. he's not. He hasn't aspired to anything like special in his life or anything. But it's like he flies a plane, you know, for you know, privately. Like that's everyone's dream. If that's just all you're doing and mm-hmm. gambling and living in the Bahamas and meets a, a pretty oh. old older lady like hell yeah like i think he's just a good guy we know he has a gambling problem yeah that michael right. so graciously just mentions in yeah. their first meeting first meeting <laughs> so, <laughs> his... like literally in the plane and like she, carla just like hits it and i'm just like oh so michael's a dick God. Would, you let, <laughs> would, you let, would you let your daughter sit in hoagie's lap as he's okay. flying the plane that line was very weird. I I did hate that. He did he did not make a good first impression when he's no. they're like because he goes yes yeah, sometimes I let interesting people sit in my lap and fly the plane. I was Whoa. like I was like yeah. bro I was like chill chill. But then yeah. afterwards he uh, he won me over by the end though. But he did not make a good first impression. <laughs> it's it is hard not to love Michael Caine. Like he's lovable. Like Michael Caine is just like charming and likable and like this and i love gene hackman but this role doesn't work if like somehow gene hackman (laughs) is playing hoagie because you always think that gene hackman would just like punch ellen in the face and say snap out of it like that's how I mean, I could see. I'm giving that to Tommy Lee Jones too. <laughs> oh my god! I mean, I, I could see. A, I could. The only other person I could see do this, and maybe it's because I just watched Thief the other day. I think James Conn could uh, do this one. 
um, even though he wouldn't have been nearly as old at the time. But like, uh, mm-hmm. he he, he could have did it. But uh, I I feel like Michael Caine he took this energy and then he got to do it again in uh, Austin Powers Gold Member while he's playing mm-hmm. Austin Powers his dad. Uh, that's him channeling a uh, hoagie yeah. energy again. That's hoagie. <laughs> I do you legitimately think... say have an issue? Here's a tissue, like on the daily. <laughs> <laughs> Mainly to myself. <laughs> so, what do we think happens with Hoagie and Ellen at the end of this? Where do we feel? Does this relationship continue? Is this just like a summer fling? You know, and Ellen goes back to Amity and she like gets it out of her system, like. Or what's going on here? Oh, I think they. I think it's a casual fling. I think like she'll just be like, oh, you know, I feel like a flight or two. Maybe she'll call him. But uh, <laughs> it didn't feel the ending feels like she's going back home to live her life. And okay. like that's what I felt out of it. And I don't think Hoagie is a part of that life. Mm-hmm. I think Hoagie gets her back on track for her life. But I don't think Hoagie is a part of that life. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree with that as well. Yeah. Like, I feel like maybe they might go on like a proper adventure now. Be like, okay, hey, now that we should survive the shark, let's go do like a, a real fun, mm-hmm. like crazy thing. And then after that, okay. yeah, she and then after that, yeah, she's back to Amity doing her doing her things. Do you think the next time Michael brings up Hoagie's gambling problem, Hoagie just goes, "Well, I fucked your mom." Do you think that that's <laughs> what he does? <laughs> If he didn't, he should have. <laughs> he does. He's he like, Michael Viserys in that little twerp. Right. <laughs> do, you, do you think he goes after Carla next? Do you think like Hoagie just tries to make his way through every woman in the <laughs> Oh my god. Family? Jaws five. And it's just Michael Caine like and Carla together. All of them betting all of Michael's family, like yeah. female family members. <laughs> it would be amazing if there was a Jaws five and it opens with like Hoagie and Carla with like Carla is on Hoagie's arm at the casino. Like she's blowing on the dice and he's riding like the hottest of hot streaks. Like the chips are a mile high, right? (laughs) It cuts to that to sad Michael at the bottom of the ocean tagging snails. (laughs) And that's it. That's the movie (laughs) and credits like the best short movie like Jaws five hoagie's revenge and that is it i i, I want the, the alternate ending I, need. I, I want the classic uh like stepdad reveal whenever it's like you find out that uh michael and carla they're divorced and uh he's going to go drop thea off with carla and then yeah. uh rings the doorbell and then who opens carla's door it's michael kane those yeah. are always uh my favorite <laughs> uh, uh stepdad reveals and he's like wait no you and then uh, they say oh, that in God. unison as well as they point at each other <laughs> Oh, this is now my is favorite Patty. episode. This is now like my favorite episode that we've ever recorded. Like going down the <laughs> Michael Caine Hoagie trail. It's just really the, I, I am going to find a way to work Hoagie into every Saw episode. <laughs> like what if Big Saw was actually played by Michael Caine doing Hoagie instead of oh. Tobin Bell? How much more would I like the Saw? Hoagie's going to be oh the God. next secret a uh, jigsaw mm-hmm. disciple mm-hmm. there's always a new jigsaw he's just disciple. trying to get people together they're sharing right. trauma <laughs> i i don't have a lot more here i do want to say a couple things i know noted they do try to recall the supper table mirror sequence in this movie with like michael and his thought daughter like they uh um they do kind of harken back to that with her imitating him and i feel really like the Poor young woman, Judith Barcy, who plays Thea. Like she was like right after this movie was shot, she was the victim of like a really horrible murder suicide at the hands of her abusive father. And she suffered years of abuse at his hands. And I believe, like from what I've read, like her mom literally had just rented an apartment to move them into. And when the dad got wind of it, uh we won't go into detail, you know, not to bring everybody down. Cause I had yeah. like made a note, like this girl, like doesn't give a shit that her uncle's been eaten by a shark. Like she's like super giddy. And then I read that and I'm like, Oh, this poor kid, like it is the worst. And she was the voice of Ducky from little the land before time. Oh, 
and no yeah, that's right. Way. That's crazy. Yeah, so like, yeah, so I'm just like, oh, my childhood. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, I Jesus. yeah, we need. Oh man, we can't end with we can't end with that. that no, is we're just, not ending with that. All right, we're see you guys next week. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're gonna end with a. Can, can, can I can I bring one thing up? Yes, <laughs> the shark roars in this, and um, it does. Yes, that thank is you. what one thing I cannot ever abide right. from this movie because sucks. Sharks that, quack. Yes, exactly. That. They, yes, exactly. They they flap their. They actually flap their fins, and mm-hmm. then there's a funny whistling sound. It sounds a lot like, like shh, shh, yeah, you hear. <laughs> and then they get a treat. And then you, then they're coming after you. <laughs> I, um, I I couldn't in my research find a reason why that happens. Did you discover in your research? I mean, why I, they chose this? I mean, this is just yeah. a. I mean, this is a. The, that's them telling you that this is a different shark because I mean. Mm-hmm. Are, I mean, do you guys believe that this is the shark from Amity that swam down to the it Bahamas? Is. Like, like <laughs> it where, is because I was shark. I was trying no. to like look for like the like matching markings or something uh, to it like has con- a kerchief. Does it? Because I was always because no. because I was okay because I was like I I kind of liked that that was like kind of the part of the ambiguity is like is this the shark? Is it not? Like it, I don't know. And like so like I don't so so if. If this shark it, roars, then I'm going to confirm that it is also psychic, and this is the one that followed it them. It is the, the shark. It is the shark that has eaten Sean, and it jump scared Chief Brody to death. It does like a crazy jump scare, and Brody's heart gives out. Like it is. It not only can do that, but it can like understand flight schedules and knows <laughs> the travel itinerary of the Brodies. But yeah, it's the shark. That's the deal. So it, why does a shark roar, Sean? Oh God, I have no idea. <laughs> Sharks can't roar; they don't have vocal cords. They don't. Like, <laughs> there's no way. So I like to think that this is actually whoever cursed them. Like they mm-hmm. became a shark and <laughs> are now. <laughs> That's how they followed them. They were like, "Oh, the Bahamas! I've been there before. I'm just gonna follow the flight." <laughs> so it's an anamorph. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, exactly. Excellent. Not only when that. I'm- <laughs> the final sequence of this movie is so or like it is it's unwatchable it's almost like sergeant is like i give up like he knew what he was doing he knew what he had he's like fuck it i give up and it is just like unwatchable in terms of how this is edited like you ra- not only does a shark roar you ram it with a boat mast and it explodes it doesn't just like get pierced and die. Like it literally explodes into a shower of like viscera and gore. Well, and which the, I don't think is what would happen. And the editing was also like funny too, because I just like didn't understand what happened. I was like, wait, mm-hmm. what? Did, I was like, what is she doing? I was like, cause she just like kind of lets out a scream. And then next thing you know, I see the shark is exploding. I was yeah. like, did she do that with her mind? I was like, uh, <laughs> how did the, was... the editing uh, was all over the place. I mean, uh, Ellen's Ellen's whole decisions and this final act are all very baffling. And what if it was with. scanners, like Jaws, but <laughs> scanners, and like they have like a mind meld, and then the shark's head explodes. Like that would be an, again. We're giving gold ideas here, right? She already has the psychic link. Like it, yep. it, it makes sense. Right. But and one she, thing. Mm-hmm. Oh, sorry. I was just gonna say. Did you see the original ending? It, it's on YouTube. I did not. So in the original ending, um, the shark literally does just get pierced and die. It does not explode, but Jake dies, and that's yes. why that's why mm. the they reshot the whole thing. And then to give it a more bombastic ending for European audiences, mm-hmm. they made the shark explode for no reason. So wait, other so, than so are they trying mind. to imply that Jake was swallowed, but then the shark exploding let him uh, out alive and swim? To, to safety I, I think that's what they're implying here. I guess so <laughs> that's the reason it exploded point. was to get Jake out <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, not only all that Ellen has flashbacks to moments she was not there for which I'm a little more forgiving film. of yeah it's like it's like the Nightmare in Elm Street remake where it's like hey you remember Wes Craven's Elm Street you could be watching that instead same thing here 
you know, like you have literally lifting moments from the original Jaws movie. And I'm a little forgiving of that. I could see Ellen recalling conversations that she had with Brody. He's like, and then I said, you get him like in his cups and like drunk enough. And Brody is like, you know, smile, you son of a bitch. And then I shot it and it exploded and it was fucking cool. You know, <laughs> I could see that. And then um, she sees that poor woman who we don't know her name, mm-hmm. who just gets eaten because they needed someone else someone to die in this, die in this movie. <laughs> like, yeah, there the- are two deaths this entire movie. And yep. it, it, it is... And one is an unnamed people. lady that yeah. was just like chilling with uh, Thea and the kids and just you know yeah, ca- catches sure it's just Margaret's mom. <laughs> don't you don't you hate it when you just catch a stray shark bite when you're out mm-hmm. with the kids? Don't you hate that? Uh you know it, and it's like you know I guess you guys would probably both agree with me that like the this whole series is like very fascinating to me in a way that of them doubling down on like not being stupid like they are like no we are still serious through and through and the camp of that i feel like is gonna at least what's gonna bring this to be like uh, a movie night watch with like friends like getting drunk mm-hmm. watch because like the again like their their commitment to being like no we are serious movies featuring sharks it's like that's just very funny to me that they just like never wanted to go stupid like with all the ideas that we've offered yep agree <laughs> I actually just... came up with a little song. <laughs> what do you got? Uh, so when the in, when Michael is in the ocean after he's been attacked by the shark the first time, um, and he gets he sees that moray eel. My brain was just like, when a snake thing hits your eye, but it's got fins on its spine, that's a moray. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, I just needed to get that out. <laughs> we. <laughs> do uh, do we have anything else or have we said everything there is to say about jaws the revenge jaws the revenge the second best jaws movie that's what that's what i'm gonna that's what i'm gonna leave with and that is only the second hottest take that you've had <laughs> on this show after you've bes- what is your favorite christmas if you say scrooged uh no, uh I really like uh the animated one where Ebenezer Scrooge is voiced by Tim Curry. Uh it was like uh one of like the 90s uh animated mm-hmm. ones. It's uh, I mean it's Tim Curry doing Ebenezer Scrooge. What else do you mm-hmm. need here? I I, so. I I didn't grow up with Muppets so I don't have the same attachment to them mm. as as most other do. I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. Not even the great Michael Caine can uh sway me on Usually... this one. Usually I'm like, there's no need to apologize. Usually I'm like, no, man, that's just your, that's totally cool. We're all, but I actually feel really, like, really strongly about this. I'm like, oh, man, fuck <laughs> you. Like, I have to get over that. So it's all right. We'll take it to Slack and we'll debate it later on. Um, I'll just start posting, like, Barbie spoilers right before you go. Like, hey, another <laughs> thing that happens. <laughs> I won't do that because that's cool. Evil. All right. All right, we're going to put Jaws the Revenge to bed, to bed. So, Sean, tell us what is coming up on the Men Who Like Men Who Like Movies podcast and where folks can find you. Oh, so we are actually talking to Trace Thurman of Horror Queers this week about a movie that I did not like when I first saw it, uh, Bug by from William Friedkin. Um, so I am excited to kind of jump back into it because I haven't watched it in since mm-hmm. I was a uh, freshman in high school. Okay. So that's coming up on ours. Um, you can find us pretty much on all the socials except for TikTok. Um, we're at men who like men who like movies. Um, or if you want to email us, we're at men who like men who like movies pod because Clayton hates us and made it the longest email ever. And uh, yeah, we're on everything from Blue Sky, Twitter, uh, uh, Facebook, Instagram. I think those are the majors. (laughs) Maybe. But the time you say Twitter may be gone. (laughs) Yeah, I was going to say Twitter might be dead. You mean X? <laughs> yeah, oh my I cannot imagine giving, <laughs> hey give us your banking information oh yeah good idea great idea all right Javon how about yourself 
I, and again, I, I don't say this like kidding, like the Spectre Cinema Club. I've been like plowing through episodes recently and really enjoying it. I actually went back and rewatched the Poughkeepsie tapes after like re listening to an old episode. Oh, yeah. On that tough watch rewatch. That movie is wild, yo. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, oh, yeah, because I was an episode with Trace, so everybody, yeah. everybody talking to Trace. Um, yeah, uh, uh, and thank What's... you, and thank you for plowing my podcast. I appreciate that. Oh, absolutely. That's, uh, that sounds like hokey to Mrs. Brody. <laughs> that, sounds, <laughs> that sounds that sounds fantastic. And uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and, uh, if you don't want to get out of the water just yet, uh, over on the Spectre Cinema Club, me and Garrett are doing aquatic horror for all of August, um, mainly non shark. Uh, uh, movies so um we'll definitely be doing a few of those as well as doing like a uh, a top 10 at the end of the month of uh best shark alligator mm-hmm. and crocodile movies which uh mike may or may not be on for i invited you on we'll clarify mm-hmm. that later mm-hmm. um uh, but then uh yeah we'll be uh doing that for all of august so you can uh, find us uh on any social media that we are on at specter cinema you can find me at underscore daddy disco on uh Twitter, Instagram, uh, Letterboxd, and all the other things. So, yeah, uh, look for me there. Excellent. And listeners, you know you can find us at Pod and Pendulum on Twitter for now. I'm probably going to start a blue ski. Thank you. You can follow us on Twitter at Pod and Pendulum. You can follow me at Mike underscore Snoonian on Twitter. But follow me in blue ski. It's just Mike Snoonian. I don't post a ton on social media, but I'm nice. Follow me on Instagram <laughs> at Mike underscore Snoonian. Really follow me. And I wish people, more people would follow me on letterbox at Mike jump change. Cause that's where I have a lot of, I've been having a lot of fun getting everything up and going there. Um, if you have had fun with this episode and you want more of us, or you just want to support the show, go to patreon.com or click on the link in our show notes and become a patron today for as little as two bucks a month you get bonus episodes every month in the month of july uh steven and i mentioned it before we did like a two-hour deep dive into the killers a criterion release uh, which is one of the best film noirs of all time you can hear our thoughts on burt lancaster and ava gardner and probably the scariest opening to a non-horror movie i've ever seen uh, we have it a different tier for a couple bucks more. Ariel and I did like a a fan commentary on Sharknado, a movie neither of us had ever seen before that. It's really to a, a 90 minutes of us shooting the shit, but it's a fun conversation. Um, so yeah, patreon.com slash pod and the pendulum. Become a patron today. It goes a long way. You know, we've mentioned the books and the movies and all that. Like we put a lot into researching and putting the show together your contributions directly fund that and it's much appreciated money can be tight and if you can't support us financially a free way to support us wherever you get your podcast but especially with apple make sure that you subscribe to us give us a five-star rating and write us a brief review about why you like this show i mean really if you're two hours into us talking about (laughs) us the revenge you like the show. You cannot be hate listening. Um, you really, and if you are, what are you doing with your life, really? All right. Here's what's coming up. Next week is going to be a kind of like mini sode. I will be, I'm on my way to Fantasia uh, this week in Montreal to cover their film fest. I'll be talking next week. Probably will be a solo show. I'll be talking about the movies I watch there and some things to look out for in the near future. I am trying to will into existence a Barbenheimer episode, but I don't know if we're going to make it happen just to talk about (laughs) these two movies because I really do love them. After that, we're going to Saw Country. Saw City, baby. Let's go. Saw County. (laughs) We have the month of Saugust the month of September, the month of Sawtober. All things Saw, part one through part 10, and then a rankings episode. We've lined up some awesome guests. We're going to have a promotion running to get you a discounted subscription or trial subscription to our friends at Ghouls Magazine. 
because we have so many of the ghouls that are going to be on uh, for those episodes. Ariel will be co-hosting every episode. And Devon, I know you're jumping in on a bunch oh, as well. Yes. I, I, we love, have... I love that the 200th episode is going to be while we're cruising through Arkansas. Um, yeah. it, it's going to be a great time. It is. It's going to be. It really, I, I, for the 200th episode, I think we're just going to quietly mark it and say thank you. And then <laughs> do what we do, which is we do the work. Um, we hope you've enjoyed this. This literally <laughs> has been some of the most fun I've had recording. Uh, I, I really had a blast. We hope you've enjoyed this one too. We hope this wasn't painful for you. I am literally going to just quote <laughs> Michael Caine as Hoagie. Hoagie. Hulk Hogan, if Hulk Hogan played Hoagie, oh my God, brother. Like looking at Ellen going, brother, <laughs> he just punches the shark in the dick and then drops a. If, if Jaws the Revenge ended with Hulk Hogan dropping the big leg on the shark and killing it that way, five stars, no notes. <laughs> Greatest movie of all time. Jaws 5, Hogan. <laughs> Hogan, Jaws the Revenge 2, Hogan versus Hoagie. All right. We're Jaws getting stupid. I'm getting stupid. We're out of here. Have a great night and have a great week, everybody. All right. We're good. That was awesome. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you. And Devon, I know you have to get going. So if you want to send me those tomorrow... Not a problem. Are you going with a big group? Are you going on a date? What is the excellent? Well, enjoy. And are you going to see you're doing Barbenheimer or just Barbie? Yep. It's sold up. It is. Yeah. Oh. Hear me out before you go. Are you a Seinfeld fan? All right. This might not mean as much. There's a Seinfeld episode where Jerry's parents stay with him and he's not able to have sex with his girlfriend for a while. So he and his girlfriend go to Schindler's List and make out during all of Schindler's List. And when his mom <laughs> finds out, She's like, you made out during Schindler's List. I want it making out to Oppenheimer to be the new let's make out to Schindler's List and have someone like, you made out during Oppenheimer? <laughs> so maybe go see it, but don't really see it. Just make out for three hours. As long as that's the only explosions you have during the movie. <laughs> no! <laughs> okay. This is my idea. I always think of true lies. You have a good night. <laughs> have a good night, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Sean. Thanks no, very absolutely. much, dude. Th yeah, no, thank you. I had so much fun. I'd love to be on right. anytime you have me. Well, if you're into any of the saws, let me know.